Session four. Session four. That song, believe it or not, was a B side of my record on Fraternity in 1959, and it went on. I found out a few years ago that it was actually voted into the Rockabilly Hall of Fame, and I would never be considered Rockabilly except for that song. It had that old sound, almost Elvis sound to it. I actually had a part one. I even did that jokingly. But that was on fraternity, and um, the way deals worked back in those days, the small labels had uh, what they called tri-state deals. They were out of Cincinnati. They distributed to Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia. And then they were like the minor leagues in baseball. What they would do if they got something cooking, a major label would come in and buy. And so Dot Records bought my contact from them, contract from fraternity. And I was excited while I'm moving up to the big leagues. And so I got, but nothing happened. It just, it, nothing, they, it's like they didn't do anything. So I decided to go out there and I got, I was going to be me and two other guys, three other guys. And we have a picture of your, your promo picture from fraternity right here on the table. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. 17 years old. Pretty 17 year old boy there. Best I remember. Uh, but anyway, I, I ended up going out with one of the keyboard player from the band. We He drove. We drove out to Los Angeles. It was quite a crazy ride. We got out there. I threw my shoulders back, my chin out, and walked into Dot Records to let them know that Richard Turley was here. And I waited and waited and waited probably from about 10 in the morning to 3 or 4. It's in the book. And no one from DOT would ever come down. None of the presidents, none of them, they just ignored that I was there. So I left feeling quite horrible. And, but years later, I, you know, through being in the business so much, I found out that basically a lot of the large labels were buying these contracts up and uh, setting them on the shelf. They didn't want them to compete with their records that they had out. So no one's ever proven that, but that's what it appeared to be. So they squelched you. Yep, they squelched me. So I, I stayed for a couple months and realized, you know, it was my bad vision. There was no way I was going to deal with that. And I was angry. Uh, there was no clubs out there. It was too early for for L.A. before they started having clubs. If you did, you had to play for the door. And if you read the book, you'll find out my door story is pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I got back on a train and uh, uh, actually uh, Hear that train as it goes past the by. It's called uh, Mama, I Wish I Could Come Back Home. So that song actually came out of that train ride. I didn't write it for years later, but that's what it was. So I went back with my tail between my legs, I guess. The big star didn't happen. and I got back and the first thing I did was I sold... Well, I'd already sold it in L.A., I'm sorry. I sold all my equipment. When I got back and mom at the train station was, where's your equipment? I said, I sold it and then walked away from her. And in the book, you'll see this. There's a segment there. She where had she, different ideas for yeah. you. <laughs> we'll <laughs> where, leave it at that. <laughs> where she bought me a guitar and an amp and the big funny story between <laughs> she and I. She was never going to be swayed away from I was going to be a singer. I had to be. Uh, I think mom already knew somehow in her heart that I was going to go be blind someday. And she knew music was what it was for me. So when you read that story, it's really funny. By the way, that's what these sessions are about, is for us to give you a little synopsis of, of each chapter where we're headed. Heading out of that, and now I was back home at the 61, actually late 61, or mid-60 when I got back. Uh, in early 61, <laughs> I finally had Dr. Chandler, who I loved with all my heart, who had, you know, taken care of my, uh, after the crazy guy was, you know, taken away. Um, I went to him and told him I needed to drive. And he says, Richard, you can't drive. I said, well, you know, I've got this contact lens now, so I can, you know what, it wasn't 61, it was 62. I said, I should be able to at least drive in the daytime. So the contact lens only gave me 20 over 70, you know, 20, 20, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So he didn't want to do it, but he did. And I, so I drove. He's hard to say no to. Yeah. 
So well, I kind of was hovering <laughs> over him. He thought maybe I was going to hit him. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, people said, my God, but they, did you ever have a wreck? And of course, I don't know if I said that in the book or not. And I said, mm -hmm. no, but I saw 17 of them in my rear view mirror. <laughs> so, a lot of cussing and stuff. So anyway, uh, I'm back in there, and I met some guys in uh, Cincinnati when I was recording for Fraternity, a group of white guys that played mostly on the record, and then some, a bunch of black dudes, which I'll tell you a story about them too, because 61 brought some crazy times in my life. Uh, if you read the book earlier about me and black kids coming to school, I guess I've always been a champion of, of that. I, I never have understood um, prejudice. I just don't have, I guess I'm prejudiced against people that are prejudiced. I, I guess that'd be the way to word it. Mm -hmm. But um, so finally these guys, I, and I told Laura, I don't know if it was four or five, I guess it doesn't make any difference. I got in a car with them like crazy man, and we went to Jackson, Mississippi to march. With the Freedom Riders. Freedom Riders. And, you know, it was lily white boys, you know, <laughs> they brought me, I now know why, uh, because I was big and I was tough, you know. So and they, we won't get into the whole story because you got to read the book for that, but there, this is on the heels of another incident where you were shot at. Yeah. For being with people who were of a different color. Right. So we'll leave that one for you guys to check out. But so, anyway. So, so anyway, we get down there and we're walking around the streets, you know, trying to figure out who to connect up with and all that. And we turn a corner and standing in front of us is, and I, I'm just going to round the figure off, 30 KKK guys in their sheets with uh, baseball bats and crowbars. And they started yelling the word in, you know, they were big time yelling it over and over and coming after us. And so you ran. So we took off running and we turned down a corner, figured we'd get away going down and it was a dead end. And they were on top of us so fast. And I really believe this may be the only time in my life, because I've been pretty stupid about not being afraid of anything, that I was literally afraid. Uh, and obviously you made it out alive, but. Yeah, well, what again. happened, a car pulled, two cars pull up. It's a sheriff, and, but it's the FBI. And the FBI backed them off, and we thought we were cool. Then the sheriff comes up and says, if we ever bring our in loving uh, asses in his town again, he'll personally pull his gun out and shoot us. You know, we, we hate you, we hate them. Get the hell out of my town. I mean, it just, it was unbelievable. We left, and we left with, it's, our hearts were like, you know, what in the name of God is wrong with these people that hate so much? And so, you know, that's that was a scar in my life to have, to see that kind of hatred because I wasn't used to it. And then, of course, uh, the book will tell you about me going to, I think it was in Montgomery or Birmingham, but wherever the Air Force Base was. It was a minute and, and a half. And we, <laughs> we got, huh? You had a minute and a half. To go? Uh -huh. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, all right, well, this one's going fast. I'm not doing my job today. <laughs> read, read the book. Read the book. <laughs> so that then led me to eventually, when I'm back home, uh, taking Jim Angel, and we found a bass player up in Parkersburg, West Virginia. <clears throat> Went up there and played. That's this picture we have on the table. Yeah. Have you got well, no, that came after that. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did that. And then after that, Jim and I went back up with the black bass uh, organ player. And we played uh, in uh, Belfry, Ohio, which is a short swim from Parkersburg. <laughs> uh, that's private in South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's where I started, you know, getting some recognition. I wore a tuxedo, of all things, for me. And I met two Swam ladies across there. across using your guitar as a kickboard. Yeah. I'm sorry. And, and, I, <laughs> and I met two ladies from New York who eventually were going to get me to New York and, and help me become a star. And I guess that's where we'll, you know, end that part now, and, and I'll pick it up going to New York. Does that sound all right? Sounds good to me. Back to it. Catch you on the next one.